Hey friend, welcome. Carm Capriato here with Remarkable Results Radio's episode 462. I'm having a conversation with AASA's President Paul McCarthy. Now our discussion went wide and we covered important topics that positively affect the aftermarket service industry. I walked away with a good feeling that Paul and the Automotive Aftermarket Suppliers Association have a handle on the opportunities and challenges of the service professional. And I told you earlier, we're 115 years old. We can go back in time. And it's fascinating to read some of our old stuff from like post-World War II, the 1950s. Almost the same words and same fears we hear from the industry now. Welcome, aftermarketers, to Remarkable Results Radio. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Hello, friends. Carm Capriato here, the aftermarket podcast guy. Hey, how are you keeping up? Well, in order to stay ahead of the curve in today's rapidly changing industry, I highly recommend you attend Apex. Now, did you know that some of the very best shop owners and technician training takes place at Apex? Now, plan to be there November 5th through the 7th at the Sands Expo in Las Vegas. If you earn your living in the aftermarket, this is the place for you. For information, visit aapexshow.com and register. I'll see you there. They go to remarkableresults.biz slash listen. Now find my listening app and over a dozen other free listening apps listed there and also find the newsletter sign up. Join in. Remarkableresults.biz slash listen. I'm with Paul McCarthy, who is the president of the Automotive Aftermarket Suppliers Association. He'll be sharing with us what AASA is doing to help bridge the connections with OEs, suppliers, and the service professional. You get to hear the latest trending talking points being discussed at all levels of our industry, like the fears surrounding the OE's support of the aftermarket, rideshare in New York City, consumer attitude due to the overcharged talk of the recession, and the access to security of our data and more. It's good to see that Paul McCarthy and AASA are all over this. And you know, we benefit. Hey, a warm welcome to Paul McCarthy, President, Automotive Service Suppliers Association. And I think the entire industry, Paul, knows that as AASA. They do. We are AASA, the Automotive Aftermarket Suppliers Association. And suppliers can be a tricky word for the industry. So for many shops, that means we represent the manufacturers. So our members are the folks who make the parts, the chemicals, the tools and equipment, the technologies that keep all the vehicles on the road and running throughout their life cycle. Parts are important to the to the service industry. I mean, I guess we wouldn't have all of this stuff going on if we didn't have a conduit for parts and we didn't have somebody making them for us and paying attention to the technology. And that's what you guys are all about. Exactly. We're all about our members are all about caring about that quality, that safety and the value so that your shops can repair the vehicles and do it in a efficient, effective way. Should also mention we're part of MEMA is our parent organization. And believe it or not, MEMA has been representing manufacturers and suppliers for 115 years. We're older than the Model T. Wow, I did not know that. Wow, granddaddy of an organization in our in our industry. Shows how long we've been there and, and all of us as an industry, how long we've been helping consumers, you know, repair and maintain those vehicles, getting people that freedom of the road. Let's use that to ground the legacy in this great, great industry that we're in. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a warm feeling. Thank you for that. And you became president of AASA on July 1st. Congrats. I did. Thank you very much, Carl. You were working your butt off with Bill Long, and he moved up to MEMA, and they finally said, you know, Paul, I think we better let you run this with a single title. So congrats. I'm glad. And, and this is our first interview with you. I've, I've done one with, with Bill in the past and, and Chris Gardner from AASA. It's great to be involved with associations. It's, uh, and I think the more we talk about associations here on the podcast, the more our service professional is going to appreciate, respect, and value all the work that get, gets done by this, if you will, overlaying umbrella inside of our industry. You're right in that 
there's certain things that we just can't do alone, where we need to gather together as an industry to make these things happen. And given the pace of change we're seeing in the industry, the bigger challenges we're seeing, uh, it's even more important for us to come together and make a difference where we can make a difference together to protect that industry so that in another 115 years, we're sitting here with whoever's doing the podcast and uh, in 3D and talking about our industry, what a great industry it is. I'm so glad you're here because I am pent up with all these things I want to talk about. I want to talk ADAS. I want to talk about the impact of technology on our industry. I want to talk about, I keep hearing things about recession, and I know you guys are so close to that, and mm -hmm. I don't want to even bring the word up, but you know what? Maybe you should talk about it. I want to talk about access to data, and I want to talk about your particular outlook on the industry. Are you ready? I am. Let's jump in. ADAS. Oh, boy. Um, it's probably the, the, the single biggest topic when you get together with your members that you talk about. It's this tremendous change in vehicle technology that we're seeing. And one of the big things we were hearing across the industry, and even among our members who are the folks developing these technologies, a year, year and a half ago, was this fear. Can we repair these vehicles? We have ADOS. We have this driving automation we have this electrification. Can the aftermarket continue to repair these vehicles? And so we went to the source. We went to the folks who should know. We went to the automakers, the folks who are developing these vehicles five years, 10 years out. We talked to the folks who are looking at service. How will these vehicles be serviced five years out or eight years out? And we got an unequivocal answer. I won't give the name of this automaker because I don't want to put them on the spot, but we had one of those engineers from the automaker and we said, can we repair these vehicles? Are we in trouble? And he said, absolutely, you can repair these. I'm developing the processes and procedures now. They are repairable. They need to be repaired. They need to be maintained. And yeah, you might have to learn to do things a little bit differently, but this can be done. And I can't tell you how reassured our members were. We went to another... Um, automotive uh, engineer from one of the big automakers. And we said, you know, well, we still need the independent aftermarket. We'll all have to go to the dealer. And he said, again, we need you. There's no way we can retear and maintain all these vehicles. Hey, glad to hear that, Paul. I'm about ready to do a town hall academy called the business side of ADAS. And uh, there's a lot of guys out there looking to uh, improve their shop, build an ADAS calibration center, there's some, mm -hmm. you know, I always say, you know, that we're, we're in this, um, uh, you know, it's a great capitalistic society and nature will always find a way to make, you mm -hmm. know, to build revenue, to support the marketplace. And I think to your point, since you're, you're reassured that we can do all this stuff, mm -hmm. it, it only takes that kind of message to take the entrepreneurs of our industry to go driving 90 miles ahead and, and build this. It's that entrepreneurialism, that innovation that has always driven our industry. And make no mistake, this is going to be a change. You've seen some of these ADOS repair facilities. They need space. You need to learn things. But I like to paraphrase Warren Buffett and say it's never a good bet to bet against the entrepreneurialism of the aftermarket. Which brings up the whole idea of Chicken Little. You're exactly right. This is not the first time we've said this in our industry. You know that old Mark Twain quote, the uh, reports of my demise are greatly exaggerated <laughs> yes. when the newspapers talked about him being dead and he was alive and kicking. We tend to do that ourselves as an industry. We always say, oh my gosh, we can't repair these vehicles. We're doomed. You go back in time, you look at when fuel injection came out. A lot of folks said, oh my gosh, this is so complex. It doesn't have a carburetor. I can't repair this vehicle. You look at it, the first few generations of fuel injection had all kinds of problems. It was a great market for us. More recently with uh, direct injection, the carbon buildup turned into a great market for us. When we had electronic control units, it was the same thing. Oh my gosh, I can never repair these vehicles. Well, ECUs and sensors, this is a huge part of our market. And I told you earlier, we're 115 years old. We can go back in time. And it's fascinating to read some of our old stuff from like post-World War II, the 1950s, it's the same, almost the same words and same fears we hear from the industry now. And at that time, they're saying, oh my gosh, these automatic transmissions, this air conditioning, this power brakes, we can't repair this stuff. We're doomed. And the industry has found a way. 
we've had to change, we've had to learn, we've had to be entrepreneurial, uh, but we've done really well over that time frame, and we'll do well again. You know, it reminds me of the big challenge when you're talking about all the electronics on the vehicle today, and the technician saying, oh, darn, I should have paid attention to the fundamental electric class. <laughs> and and how important it is today. We talk about that all the time on the show, and some of the trainers saying they have these basic electric classes and nobody shows up and they change it to the fundamentals of basic electricity and oh, well that doesn't that doesn't say i don't know anything because that happens to be one of the most important classes that the service professional technician should go mm-hmm. to over they, they they almost claim the trainers say every couple of years you got to come because it continues to uh, get ingrained in you and you're always learning one new thing each and every time and and we can't That's get great. by in our life today servicing the vehicles without a super solid knowledge of volt ohms and amps and all the Mm -hmm. theories of electricity that i don't know much about but i'm so (laughs) respectful of what it takes this whole electrification thing you said the word ev a little while ago Mm -hmm. do the suppliers that you represent say "Hmm, there's going to be a lot less parts on those someday Well, electrification and hybrid vehicles, if you look at it, the vehicles that are out there now, and you look at some of the numbers, they do require a little bit less to maintain. It's not as as much as some of the doom and gloom headlines, but on average, you look at some of the data about 9% less in dollar value of kind of repairs. That might be scary, but the flip side of what we're seeing and why we're positive about the industry is... If you look at electric vehicles, they're pretty appealing to actually drive them day to day, especially when you look at all these driver assist technologies. I just recently did a a long drive, typical summer family trip, and it was in a vehicle with a bunch of this ADOS technology. And what I found was having just drive a vehicle with non-ADOS was how much easier it was, how much more relaxing it was because it had the automated cruise control that kept me behind. Did you rent the car specifically because you wanted to play? Exactly. How cool is that? It, and I, I used the, the proper word. I, I wanted to play. You said you f- you ultimately got relaxed, but were you nervous in the beginning to turn all this stuff on and see how it worked? Not sure I was nervous because I was too excited. I'm too much of a car geek. Got it. And although I like horsepower as Nexus and X person, the new toys are, they're the new car toys. Let's see what this car can do. And uh, so I, I approached it with an open mind. But what was great was how much less tired I was at the end of that four-hour drive than I expected. And we'll see that more and more as this driver assist continues. And so what we're seeing, whether it's car sharing, whether it's the driver assist, is that people end up driving more miles. And they tend to use the vehicle more because as you get increased this driver assist, it'll be easier to do those distances. It'll be easier to do the long commute. So we're actually... Most of the forecast now going forward when you go out 20 years, 30 years, is for a dramatic increase in miles driven around the world, including here in the U.S., because we've now just made driving more appealing because it's less tiring. Uh, With some of the help that will give us to drive, it will give us some time back. We know time is the most valuable commodity we have. And I'll tell you this, miles driven is always good for the aftermarket. So... Even with its new vehicle technology, when you sort of crunch the numbers, you come out with a scenario which has more automobility, more people driving more miles. And that means that we'll have more demand. And add to the fact that these are more complex parts that cost more to repair and that need to be maintained. The net picture is that the aftermarket, even if electrification means uh, electric vehicles means a little bit less repair on those particular vehicles, that we'll have more demand. And we actually did a study to prove this because, again, we heard a lot of fear in the industry saying electrification, these things, it's going to shrink our market. So we projected out to 2030, we work with PwC Strategy Ann, to say in dollars and cents, is the aftermarket going to grow or shrink as a result of these new vehicle technologies? And what we found is out to 2030 that the aftermarket had a much longer tail than people appreciate. There's hundreds of millions of vehicles on the road. If you go out to 2030, the vast majority of the market at that time and a majority of the growth will be all the repairs we already know, all the parts, all the typical things we already know we're already doing. 
At the same time, we can't be ostriches and put our heads in the sand. That study said that 36% of the expected growth, especially towards the end of that window, it's coming from new products, new technologies. It's coming from some of those electrification technologies, those ADOS technologies that are newer to us. So if you want to grow as fast as the market, you can't be an ostrich. You need to learn more. You need to do some of the things that you'll be talking about at, at, your, uh, at your course about some of these, these new technologies. But we have a long tail, as we say, for the aftermarket and the things we know and the things we're doing to repair and maintain these vehicles. Hey, Carm here. Now, you know I attend Apex in Las Vegas each year. It's my must-attend show for one simple reason. It keeps me up to date on everything in the global automotive aftermarket industry. At Apex, I see, touch, and compare the latest new tools and equipment in the industry. I learn how new technology is affecting independent repair shops. I sit in on advanced training sessions on underhood service and alternative fuel vehicles. And so important, I network with others facing the same opportunities and challenges. I know many of you are shop owners, managers, or technicians. I also know going to Apex means time away from your business. But I simply don't know how you can stay ahead of the huge transformation and changes taking place in the industry without attending Apex. Hey, make Apex your must-attend show. The dates are Tuesday, November 5th through Thursday, November 7th at the Sands Expo in Las Vegas. Registration, it's only $40, and it only takes a few minutes. Go to aapexshow.com. I like that word long tail that that really to me sends a, a really powerful message. You've just told me this. The service professional has a um, a great opportunity in front of them. I, I believe they need to invest in education, invest in technology, invest mm -hmm. in equipment and tools. Uh, they probably need to grow some multiple locations because I just believe. Uh, who was it uh, telling me one day that, you know, the number of clients that you need to support a service center today is going to grow because of the less, some of the less work that's going to be done. As you say, 9% less dollars, maybe there's some less parts, yet um, there's an economy of scale that says we need to, we need to grow. I mean, there's big corporations buying market share by buying bays out there. No, mm -hmm. no doubt. What's the small independent backbone of our industry going to do? they've got to reinvent themselves. I think we'd agree with that wholeheartedly, Carm. And with that reinvention, we think the technicians, we think the shop owners can thrive, but there'll be change. They can't be afraid of it. They have to be down on the ground floor of it, uh, attend seminars, go to, go to ADAS seminars, even if it's not about how things get plugged in, but go learn about you know, the impact of the technology on the industry. That's well said. We got to be a learning industry. You know, sometimes we're scared of change, but change isn't a bad thing. If you look at sort of the basic economics, we had, sometimes have to remind our members of this too. Without change, there's no profit. In basic economics, if you don't have change, you get a competitive market and profit gets taken out of it. So it's that change that creates our opportunities for profit and to learn to do things differently and to succeed. You know, that's so smart. I've heard some doom and gloom stories. I've actually read a couple of reports about how we're going to get rid of, you know, half of the vehicles that exist in our world because of rideshare uh, and, and this ever changing, you know, generations as they come up and say, hey, I don't want to own a car. And, you know, metropolitan transportations, et cetera, et cetera. Hell, did you just hear that in New York they want to ban cars from certain roads? I mean, ah, it's, it's amazing how society is almost pushing a little bit against what we do. You said something so important about miles driven. People still want to have a life and go out and vacation and spend time and, you know, do things. And uh, have you ever looked at those doom and gloom? We're going to st stop with these kinds of cars. We're going to, you know, the, the whole carbon footprint. What do you guys think of this? It's been a big point of discussion for almost 10 years now. But what's interesting is you look at that, you go back five plus years, all those forecasts were, there's going to be no vehicles. Nobody wants to drive a vehicle. We're all going to live in cities and high rises and, uh, and share vehicles. The more recent forecasts by the futurists have changed dramatically, and they are more around more miles driven. Maybe a few fewer vehicles, but if those vehicles are being driven dramatically more, that's not a bad thing for the aftermarket. And what's changed is several things. You'd mentioned New York. With the advent of ride sharing, do you know what's happened in New York? 
they've had a 600 million miles a year increase in miles driven in the New York City metropolitan area. Because of car sharing, it's made automobility more appealing and more attractive and more convenient. So they've had a huge explosion of miles driven. The thing that's actually been losing out is public transport. You look across America, and now as millennials are getting older and having kids, the fastest growing areas are, again, it's the Sun Belt, it's the suburbs, again. And if you look at the upcoming generation, Gen Z, Gen I, the iGen, they have a very different view of cars. The millennials admittedly weren't that thrilled with cars, but the iGen is a little bit different in that the cars that they grew up hearing about were Teslas. They were automated Google cars. Cars are actually kind of cool to them. They're a technological device. And that generation also, by the way, really wants to live in the suburbs, according to some of the demographic stuff. So again, it's that Mark Twain quote, the reports of our demise are greatly exaggerated. It's what you said earlier. It's ultimately going to be the free market. How do Americans want to live and how do they want to do things? And as people have been kind of futuring that actual data, they're much more positive about the prospects for our industry and for our industry growth. I love it. Uh, you are you are so tuned in, and uh, wow, I'm I'm learning a lot, and I, I feel really good about all the cool things that you know. So, since you're all world, <laughs> since you're all world, I just read this morning about in the paper about recession, and I just it just made me get goosebumps, and I'm thinking I just don't want to go through another one of these. Okay, so whatever, however the big levers of corporate America are pulled that moves our economy into all these crazy curves, how does the aftermarket do based on your research in recession? You know, it is a scary word out there, isn't it? To read that in the news, recession. You kind of heard the things we've been talking about. We've been talking about a little bit of a theme of myth busting because there's some of these myths out there about our industry being doomed or, or some of the things these misimpressions about our industry. And there's some myth busting around recession as well. So some folks we talk to in the industry say, oh my gosh, a recession is coming. We are doomed. Other folks we talk to say, hey, recession is coming. That's the best thing for the aftermarket. People won't buy new vehicles and we're just going to boom. What we found, we said we needed to figure this out for our members. So we went back over 50 years of data, looking at the economy going up and down, said, how does the aftermarket perform? And what we found was neither of those stories were really true. We are what technically you might call weekly cyclical. And what that means is when the economy does well, we tend to grow. We tend to do pretty well. We don't maybe spike like new vehicle sales. We do okay. When the economy goes down, we tend to feel it as well. We, our growth slows down a little bit. In a bad downturn like we had in 2007 and nine, we actually declined a little bit. So we do feel it. But at the same time, it's nothing like the new vehicle side or other parts of the automotive industry. You look at performance, you look at new vehicles, they go way down. New vehicles went down over 45% peak to trough. We went down a couple of percentage points. And if you look at other consumer goods, because that's what we are in the repair and maintenance industry, they get hit much harder. So we do feel it. But we're also one of the best places to be during a recession. And it's partly because we do have some elements of our business which are counter cyclical. There's a reality that some people say, well, I'm gonna put off buying a new vehicle or getting another vehicle a little bit more. So maybe I'll fix that and keep it on the road. Um, but there's also a lot of people who defer maintenance, who defer repair, who say, you know, I'll leave that check engine light on because I don't think I have the, I don't feel like I have the money right now to make that repair or the brakes are squealing. Oh, I'll, I'll leave it for a little bit. And so the net effect is, is we'll feel it, but it's not like the sky's going to fall and we will be one of the best places to be in the general economy if there is a recession and hopefully there's not. Well, thanks for bringing your uh, fireside wisdom to to that. Hopefully that was just uh, n nothing we have to worry about for a while. It's just that I think it wasn't bad that we talked about it, because especially from AASA's perspective, th these are things you have to stay on top of. And it's nice for people not to overreact or get too worried. You know, I saw somewhere that one of the best predictions of whether there's going to be a recession is how many times it's mentioned in the press. 
That is a self-created phenomenon. So let's stay positive and hope it doesn't happen. Well, the press is having fun with that. Oh, my. Hey, um, access to data, uh, a huge topic here on the podcast. Uh, we've, had, we've done a lot of shows on it recently. Um, your particular view and angle and what are you telling your members? Well, I think you've done a great job of covering it, and we appreciate that. And because this is so important for the long term of our industry, this is about the future of our industry and defending what we have. But one of our members did an analysis and they figured out that there's already 100 million vehicles on the road today that have some type of repair constraint. Now, many of those may be very small, may even be maybe things you don't even run into unless the vehicle's in a collision. But the number of repair restraints that we'll see, things that we can't repair like we have for the last century, those will increase in the parts of the vehicle and they'll increase in the number of vehicles if we don't do something. And we've seen it already with some of the, you know, some automakers OBD2 ports, you can't get in there unless you get a code from the automaker. We've seen it with VIN burning on some of the parts where if this isn't the part that originally came on the vehicle, you can't put it on the vehicle. With some of the software that is coming in the electrical architectures that are coming out from the big automakers uh, starting this year, they can do like Tesla has done, where it can send a little code. And if this part didn't come from Tesla and doesn't have the right code that said it was repaired by a Tesla uh, dealership or, or service professional, even if that part is safe, even if it may even be better than the OE part, even if the repair technician who did it knows what they're doing, is trained uh, and is an expert, it can't go on the vehicle. The vehicle won't run. So these are examples of the threats that we have. It's a real threat. Not having this access to data, this continued ability to repair, will lose what has served consumers well for 100, over 100 years. Paul, a few minutes ago, you said you talked to a manufacturer about ADAS capabilities and can we repair them? And is this on the other side of their mouth? Are they are they looking, well, you guys can do that, but you can't do this? Well, I don't want to cast stones, but it's fascinating for us when we talk to different levels of the automakers. Because remember, we represent the manufacturers. We sell parts to everybody along the chain. We sell it to the manufacturers. Uh, to the automakers, we sell it to the independents. We do it all along there. We just want to make sure that people have the parts to re repair their vehicles. But we also fundamentally believe in a free market, a competitive market, and we think that best serves consumers. And that has worked well for the industry for over 100 years in supporting mobility. But when we talk with the automakers, it's an interesting story. When, when you talk with the folks who are in charge of service and repair, they tell us the things that you heard earlier. We need you to repair these vehicles. We know you can repair these vehicles safely and securely. But what you hear from other parts of the automakers, maybe folks who are more concerned about Wall Street and getting their stock price to a certain level is, we need to try to have a monopoly on this. We need to have all that data. And we understand where that comes from because you look on Wall Street and if a company can say, I'm a data play, they're worth a whole bunch more money. So it's not as exciting to be what our guys are and say, I'm a manufacturer. I make an amazing vehicle. That doesn't seem to excite Wall Street. And so we get this weird kind of story where they want to say they're a data play. It's scary to, to hear what you just said and to then have me climb the ladder to find the code to make the part work on the car. And I can see costs, I can see technologies, I can see almost certifications. I, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of implication here. And it's a lot of potential market constraint. And that's what this comes down to, because this issue of access to data, it's not about defending the aftermarket, although that's maybe a piece of it. This is ultimately about consumer rights, consumers' freedom, their freedom to choose where they get their vehicle maintained. With what parts? Amen. And, and I don't even think they realize the problem. Absolutely. And you've seen the petition that the industry has put forward at Your Car, Your Data. And we encourage uh, professionals to sign on to that. We encourage you to talk to your congresspeople to make your voice be heard. Because if you look at the aftermarket, you look at our manufacturers, we have people 
in every district in the US. We have jobs in every district in the US. And that voice needs to be heard to say, this is important to preserve those jobs and to preserve this industry that serves consumers and creates jobs in the US. But this is ultimately, this is about freedom. This is about free markets. This is about freedom for consumers to choose. And this is about consumer rights. So again, we serve everybody across the chain, but fundamentally a free market is the best way to serve this and to ensure that we have safe, affordable mobility that allows America that freedom of movement and the ability to keep moving. Paul, do you see this is going to be a state by state issue or is the federal government going to get involved? We think in the end, a lot of these issues, the the experts in Washington tell us that probably the federal government will say this is a federal issue because this comes down to issues of safety. It comes down to issues of cybersecurity and privacy. And those typically end up at the at the federal level. And so sooner or later, we're going to have to get some kind of federal legislation to ensure uh, that we continue to have these competitive markets. Well, look at I'm be sure that on your show notes page we have the uh, the your car your data link uh, as we did with uh, as we did with Bill Hanvey and of course Bob Redding. Anytime we get together with us with association uh, executives uh, and leaders, uh, we're, we're always we're always pushing this. And you know, one of the things that I can't do enough on my little bully pulpit is to tell the automotive aftermarket that the largest number of people that we employ, the largest number of shops, the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest consumer facing part of our industry the service professional they've got to get involved it is it's really their their future and i don't care if you're a baby boomer and you own your shop and you think your time is limited we still need your your help because if you, there's a succession plan or family involved please um uh, paul am I, i'm not groveling enough am i no, you're, you're absolutely right, Carm. And we hear that from folks of saying, well, I don't really see it right now. It's coming and it's coming on those new vehicles. And if we don't act now, we're going to have a generation of vehicles we can't repair. And a generation of folks who have a vehicle that's worth less because it can't be repaired affordably, even if you're looking to retire in a few years, hopefully you're expecting to still keep driving. So as a vehicle driver and owner, take action, make your voice be heard. So I'm a member of AASA, and and I pick up the phone and I say, hey, I'm getting ready to talk to my people, Paul. Um, What can I tell them about our future outlook, our next five or 10-year outlook? Well, we are pretty darn positive about the aftermarket. And we have, we do this annually for our members. We call it the Aftermarket Size and Forecast Report. And it's actually just hot off the press. So I'll share with you a few things. Oh, we've got some data. (laughs) I'll share with you a few factoids, and I should say this is based on the joint channel forecast that we do with our friends at AutoCare. But a few of the findings. Did you know that over the last 20 years, that the size of the aftermarket in dollar terms has more than doubled? So it's pretty impressive, our growth. Another good factoid is that last year, in end consumer dollars, the size of the maintenance and repair market for light vehicles was $298 billion, almost $300 billion. So you talk about folks' voices needing to be heard. We're a big industry. We matter. And we need to make sure that we have a voice that's as big as our impact that's out there. So overall, so it's $298 billion last year. And by 2022, we're forecasting it to grow to $338 billion. So growth, uh, about 3.3%, nice growth, pretty steady, a year. It's interesting to look at that growth in terms of where it's coming from, because it's not really units. It's not more repairs happening. It's what you mentioned earlier, Carm, is this increasing complexity, these more expensive, more complex parts and repairs that may require more labor or more expensive, more educated labor. And that's where our growth is coming from. So as an industry, we need to make sure that we price for that additional value and technology and knowledge and learning that we're bringing. That's a great point. Multiple labor rates. uh, All of this is going to impact. We cannot sit behind, you know, armed with this data. We can start making decisions today about tomorrow. Very well said. 
And as opportunities, we think, for shops, we see positive growth prospects for the aftermarket. And we're just a great industry to be in. If it wasn't on the business side, but we also like to say, we're also a great industry to be in because we're an industry with the best people. And you know it, Carm. You go around, you talk to everybody in this industry. We're just, we're a good business and we're great people. Paul, thank you. I cannot leave you unless I ask one final question that's just on the tip of my tongue and everyone in the industry. How do you see consolidation as an impact going forward? It's been a trend in our industry for a long time. And you look at our supplier side, the manufacturers, we've been seeing consolidation uh, happening for years. Honestly, at the manufacturer level, it's a, it's a matter where people are coming together and people are falling apart. So we're pretty consolidated. So we don't have a lot to play there. Look at the distribution side. Retailers and distributors have been consolidating for a lot of years. Probably more to come. Although with the omni-channel reality, we're actually seeing new players as well as old. So it's fairly consolidated and that'll probably mix. Our studies say, for better or for worse, the biggest action that we're going to see is on the shop side because there are a lot of people looking to retire because there's a lot of technology coming. It's what you said earlier. If you're really good at what you do, maybe you need to, you'll probably need a little bit more capital to work in this more technological industry. So maybe you'll need multiple locations or a bigger shop or more capabilities. And so the biggest change and the aftermarket moves slow. I'll tell you that. We, we have time to adjust. We tend to move pretty slowly because we are, we're a big industry, established industry. But if you look out 20 or 30 years, we think the shop landscape will look a lot different. We also think it'll be very vibrant and very successful and very professional and impressive. Great advice coming from you, Paul. Thank you so much. Paul McCarthy, President. AASA, the Automotive Aftermarket Suppliers Association. Man, thanks for giving me a half hour of your time today, man. Well, thanks, Carr. We enjoy it. And just want your folks to know that our manufacturers, our suppliers, we're out there to try to help the shops succeed. Because as we say, it's, it's the guy who throws away the box. That's our consumer. That's our customer. And um, we need to help you succeed. And we're doing everything we can to uh, to bring the technologies, bring the training and make us all successful. Well said. Thanks for being there for us. Thank you, Carl. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time. 